My name is Barry Graham. I'm chairman of the Marines Memorial Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit foundation honoring the service and sacrifice of veterans from all services. Uh, we're the Marines Memorial Club. Uh, we were started in 1946 when the Marine Corps actually bought this building. But uh, for those of you out there from the Army and the Air Force, we have more Army and Air Force members than we do Marines, and we're glad to have them. We also have uh, Coast Guard and Navy uh, members. Uh, we run a variety of programs during the year. Many of you may be familiar with the Gold Star Parents Commemoration. The program you're at tonight is relatively new. We wanted to start a program called Leadership Lessons Learned because within, if you think about uh, 100 miles of where we're sitting, there are CEOs of the major Fortune 100 companies who manage international operations, uh, hundreds or thousands of employees, and face challenges every day. We thought it would be helpful and interesting and insightful to bring some of those leaders on board here and have them uh, share their experiences and their insight with us. To do that, uh, Tim Shaw, who is one of our board members from the Marines Memorial Association and a West Point grad and an Army member, has been instrumental in uh, recruiting leaders to speak in this series. So, Tim, go on and join me. Thank you. I'll be introducing Mark this evening. Mark really needs no introductions. He's a veteran that's done it all, and I think his background will share a bit about all of the things he's accomplished. A West Point graduate, an Army attack helicopter pilot, a lawyer, and someone who can say they defended their nation in and outside the uniform on land, air, and cyber. As a former CEO of Palo Alto Networks, which he led for seven years, in Silicon Valley, that's about 70 years. Uh, if that was Twitter, that's probably about 1,000 years. Um, he grew the company from an emerging startup to one of the world's leading security firms. Mark is remaining on the board of Palo Alto Networks and is also on the board of Qualcomm. Some interesting facts about Mark. West Point was the only college he applied to, and his wife, Karen, is also a West Point graduate. During his copious amounts of free time, he enjoys fly fishing, which, he, which we hope he be able to do the next few days but, and weeks, but we doubt that'll happen. Most importantly, we are delighted to have him at the Marines Memorial Club, this event for our third Leadership Lessons event. Mark will be sharing some thoughts about, with us about leadership, his transition from the military, his rise from being a lawyer to VeriSign to Palo Alto Networks and beyond. Please write down your questions during Mark's talk on the piece of paper on your chairs. And during the Q&A portion, I will be moderating those questions. Thank you, Mark, for being here, and we're uh, looking forward to your wisdom. Thanks for that, Tim. I don't know about wisdom, but I'll let you want to know anyway. So really a pleasure to be here tonight. Thanks so much for turning out to, uh, to, to this event and to such a, a great association as well. Uh, Barry, I, uh, you know, I told my brother I was coming up here tonight. He's a uh, Marine Corps uh, field artillery officer, or, or was an officer. I, I've learned to say he used to be a Marine. When I say that to Marines, they say there's no such thing as a used to be a Marine. There's only Marines. So I was an Army officer, and uh, but I have a lot of uh, um, very close friends from Marine Corps uh, through the, so, through my brother. And I always tell them the same thing, which was um, I really actually wanted to be in the Marines, uh, but I couldn't pass the physical. And um, I couldn't get my head in the jar. So <laughs> I ended up in the Army. But uh, <laughs> glad to be here. And as uh, Tim said, uh, uh, you know, uh, a little change in my life happened actually today. The, um, I retired from uh, Palatine Networks today. It was my uh, last day of work. Um, thank you. As the uh, chairman and CEO there, I'm the vice chairman of the board now, and um, uh, had the great pl privilege of leading that company for the last seven years, to, um, and with amazing team efforts, become the largest cybersecurity company in the world in 10 years' time, which is a pretty amazing feat of, for the team to have done that. And uh, But I'll, I'll start kind of at the end with that, which is uh, from leadership things that um, you know I have learned, and I have so much more to learn uh, about that myself. Um, was the idea of that uh, a leader should know when to leave. Right? <laughs> the military does that automatically, right? You know, they're going to rotate you out. You're not going to be able to stay anywhere forever, right? But in the corporate world, that's not the case. And I think that um, a lot of folks uh, you know, become so associated with one thing 
that uh, they don't they don't know how to do anything different. They become very comfortable with that, and that's actually often a problem, you know, for those organizations. So to uh, to self select out is uh, something that I think is actually pretty important after seven to ten years, and just let somebody else take the reins to see what you're not thinking about because your name is you know you're you're so close to the paper on that right. But I go way back in the beginning and say um, you know how to get that Palo Alto or be able to come here tonight and talk to you. Um, I, I did uh, go to the United States Military Academy. Um, it was the only um, uh, college that I applied to. Uh, my mom was like, are you out of your mind? You know, and, uh, But I was just certain I wanted to do that. I don't know why. I have no military history in the family. Um, I probably read a pop-up book when I was six years old or something about West Point, and it just stuck with me, but that was it. So I applied to one school. Thank God I got in. And uh, and uh, you know graduated and then went uh, into aviation. I was a Cobra pilot, um, and that's all I ever wanted to do. Was actually, if you had asked me when I was a lieutenant, you know, and I just got out of there, I said, "What are you gonna? Where are you gonna be when you're 52?" Which is what I am today. I would have told you that I'd be very close to be on my way to hopefully, uh, you know, um, general in the army, right? Because that's all I ever wanted to do. And then I had a uh, um, an accident. A helicopter accident and my career was over you know in 10 seconds and um, you know I was medically discharged um, after that I didn't know what to do with that you know and uh, so some lessons in life started to get learned right then which was um, that uh, sometimes the worst things in life could be the best things in life right so I'll put that in I'm not sure it's a leadership lesson but I'll put that in a lesson of just how to think about life because at that time uh, my wife Karen who was my classmate at West Point um, and graduated much higher in the class than me, I should note, uh, because if she were here, she would tell you that. The uh, much higher in the class than me, um, we went our separate ways after graduation. Um, I was off on my way to uh, Camp Eagle in, in Korea, and she was off to Fort Lewis in Washington, and um, that's when I had this helicopter accident. And um, uh, as a result of that, I was going to I was going to be uh, medically discharged. That took a long time from a board process perspective, and the Army, in their wisdom, said. As you all recall, from your veterans, you know, where do you want to be stationed? You know, you get that sheet, you fill it out. Top three, bottom three, you know. So I specifically wrote on there, you know, the top three locations. And the, uh, the bottom one, I said, whatever you do, don't send me to Fort Lewis. And uh, sure enough, they cut me orders, and that's where I went. And, um, and, but for that, we wouldn't be married. I'm positive of that, right? So what I thought was the worst thing in my life turned out to be the, you know, uh, after my children, you know, my best thing in my life ever. Right, and I, I tell young people that these days as well. I mean, I'm not that old, but uh, young people as well, which is, um, you know, don't don't call the ball, you know, when it's coming across the plate, right? You know, you got to wait to see uh, how it's going to turn out for you later on. But I got out of the service or was discharged from the service. Uh, didn't know what to do, and uh, so I decided I would become a lawyer because, you know, why not? Right? I didn't have any hankering to really be a lawyer, you know. But I became a. I went to law school, fortunately, and. Um, I have a, a, I'm not going to bore you with this story, but I can over a beer later on. Um, I'm the first person in the United States uh, to have the Veterans Administration pay for law school uh, for a disabled veteran. Um, and there's a hell of a story behind that, that uh, because uh, the program for you know disabled vets to, to be retrained for things. Being a lawyer wasn't one of those things, um, but I... But I guess I was going to be a good lawyer because I said, it doesn't say that. No. <laughs> and anyway, the uh, veterans, uh, and I, I mean, I'm super uh, grateful for this. Uh, in addition to my military service, sent me to law school as well. So uh, thank you for that as taxpayers. Uh, so I got to, out of law school. And, um, and then I started a very circuitous route um, through uh, the corporate ranks over time. We're just being open to different things. Um, but most importantly, if I tracked my, if you looked at my resume, um, one way to look at it is say, wow, it looked like it turned out okay. The other way to look at it was say, this guy can't hold a job. You know, he, he was trying to be an army officer, he was trying to be a lawyer, then he became a business development guy, then he became a, you know, so-and-so, and it ended up, uh, you know, where I'm standing here this evening. Um, but the point of that, another leadership thing for me was um, every single time in my career, uh, when I had an opportunity, it was because somebody gave it to me. Um, I was not the person that you would have hired for the job, you know. And if you had a thousand resumes, I was a thousand and one, meaning from a skill set perspective. And uh, but always somebody said, looked and said, for whatever reason, you know, this is the guy we're going to give that opportunity for. Um, think he's going to work really hard, or whatever the you know whatever the reason was. And I got that shot. 
you know, to, to do it. And, um, and it turned out in every case to, to work out well for both of us. Um, but I'll call that the pay it forward aspect of leadership as well, which is really, uh, you know, don't get so hung up on what the resume says. You're actually looking for character, right, and values and all the stuff that in, as, as veterans and folks who associate with veteran communities would intrinsically understand, right? And I think that's very important today in trying to help veterans get into the workforce. And that'll be the next part of my little story here, which was when I was coming out of the service uh, after being medically discharged before I went to law school, that wasn't my first choice. My first choice was um, multiple companies that I went to and applied for jobs into management development programs. Um, and a number of those required you, like Ernest and Julio was one of them. I remember as you know the wine company, right? And they have a, they actually are very well known for um, a very good management uh, program. And this, another one was uh, Frito Lay, you know the chip people, right? They are actually very well known for a very good management program. But each one of those required you the first thing to do is to learn the business, which was get in the field, go stock the shelves. That was you had to spend six months stocking the shelves so you'd understand what a driver had to do, right, and how they how they made their living. And that stuck with me as saying, hey, you got to get in the you got to get in the trench, right, to figure it out if you want to be the general. You know what the what does a private have to do? That was something I had already internalized from uh, West Point, but I was unable to do that physically. Was unable to do that, so I was not able to get those jobs. Right, and uh, then I finagled my way into law school through the veterans. Uh, but that stuck with me later on, and still does today. And work that we try to do with Vets and Tech, and you know, Catherine organization sitting here this evening. Um, it's really really hard as a corporate uh, uh, employer to take somebody from a service perspective and map their their career to anything that happens in, a, in the office, almost anything. It's very, very difficult, right? And you could be a highly decorated combat veteran, uh, 06, you know, right? Trying to get onto your, your next career. And companies have no idea what to do with you, right? Because they say, you, know, you were a helicopter pilot and I'm looking for a tax accountant, right? And they really aren't the same thing, right? You know? <laughs> So trying to, what I learned personally about that was um, mapping your, you know, what your skill sets are from a, a military perspective into the corporate world is extraordinarily difficult. And the, the fallback position will always be, um, you, do you have the right stuff? The things that the military is known for. You're probably going to get somebody who is uh, ethical, honest, a hard worker, mission oriented, uh, will, will die on the front steps before they'll give up the mission, you know, kind of uh, attitude. And that's what we really have to try to get people to think about, because I went through that myself. So I really think about that on that pay it forward aspect of what can we, what can we do about that? And if I keep going a little bit further, um, there's a lot of things um, that, uh, that I was taught at West Point um, and that you, you may have been taught in the, in the service in different places at different times. Um, that I actually had no idea what they meant until kind of recently, you know, when you get to be the CEO of various things, right? They're just I'll call it the further up you go on the ladder, right? And um, but they really they really stick with me now as far as um, they may sound simple, but they're really important, right? And I, I tell this all the time uh, in my own company and uh, in different uh, sit on the board of Qualcomm and Qualcomm down there in San Diego. And they'll say, um, you know, what's good leadership? Like, tell me, you know, how do you determine good leaders and things? And I said, well, I learned a few things at West Point. And, you know, the first one was, the saying was, lead, you know, leaders lead. You know, and everybody says, you know, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> I said, well, leaders lead. Like, leaders actually make decisions. They are decisive, right? They, somebody actually ultimately has to make a decision about something. And that's what leaders do. They lead. And, uh, and leadership has a lot more elements than being decided to make decisions, but that's the first one. Like somebody has to be in charge and somebody has to be responsible, right? And, this, and you don't see that a lot, you know, where people, lots of people want to be leaders, uh, but they actually don't want the obligations to go with leadership, right? Which led to the second thing, West Point, you know, that they, you know, drilled in the bugle notes, right? Uh, back at West Point was, um, um, you, know, seek, uh, you know, seek responsibility, but take accountability. For that, so and I've learned that or seen that play out many, many, many times in the corporate world. I've had so, so many people that have, uh, you know, that I've had the pleasure to work with and to work for me. Um, they always come in and say, um, "I've been a director for five years, and it's uh, I'd like to be a vice president now, right?" And I'd say, "Okay, uh, outside of longevity, 
um, do you know what the vice president does? You know, and they say, yes, I understand that ex you know, exactly. I'm like, all right, um, so do you know that the first thing you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to fire Sally, who everybody loves, because she's not performing. I'm like, oh, well, I don't wanna fire Sally. <laughs> like, well, whoever the next vice president is, that's the very first thing they need to do, because Sally's not performing, right? And the point of that little you know, th story, which I'll tell them, is to say, that's what the leader has to do. The leader, the leader actually has to make hard decisions and enforce hard decisions, because all the easy ones are gonna be made before they get to you. you know, every single, I can tell you as the CEO, right, you know, there are no easy decisions come to my desk, none. You know, they're always the ones that people couldn't figure out already, and they're usually the ones that are controversial or super difficult to do that. So I always tell people is, look, if you wanna have uh, responsibility, you have to take the accountability for the responsibility, right? That is exactly what it means, and that is your only reward. It's not the big office, it's not the money, it's not whatever. Your only reward is increasing responsibility. Um, because through that increasing responsibility and the decisiveness that you're required to do, you're going to figure out who you are. And that would be the third point, right? Which is, um, um, I think good leaders um, over time are really defined by very basic concepts. No matter how many leadership books get written, you know, it always comes back to the basics, right? Are you, are you honest? Are you authentic? Uh, do you care more about your people than yourself? Um, you know, for those who were in the army, you know, they would always say. You come off the field exercise, right, or you come out of combat, first thing you do is take care of your equipment. And the second thing you do is you take care of your people. And the third thing you do is take care of yourself, right? And, um, you know, in that attitude and bringing it in the corporate world, um, actually, I'd say, argue in a lot of places in today in society, you just don't see that at all, right? And what I've learned uh, through my corporate progression on leadership is actually really discouraging, candidly, um, where... I've not met anybody, I, I've never, ever, ever met anybody that did not think they were a good person. Everybody I've ever met through my life, you know, and it's definitely in work, has always believed that they were kind, generous, honest, hardworking, ethical, mission-oriented, team first, everybody, right? And, um, which is great, and then it's, what I've learned over time is about 98% of them aren't. You know, and the reason, and you see it, it happens, right? Is in whatever, whether it's ambition or usually money, when, the, when that comes up, uh, human beings have an unbelievable way to rationalize about why the next thing they're gonna do is the right thing, is the right thing. When it's so obviously the wrong thing to do for themselves, for the organization, for their team, probably even their family, right? And uh, you know, if you're in business, and many of you are, um, I've learned the telltale sign of that conversation. It goes something like this. For the good of my family, you know, I need to do X. As soon as I hear those words, you know, I'm, I, I know that the person is about to tell me they're going to do something that is the absolute worst modeling behavior for their children, All right? They're about to leave the team in a lurch to take an extra $5,000 from the next company that comes along or chase the title or whatever they're gonna do, but they always say that to me, which is, it's the right thing for my family. I'm like, no, actually it's not, you know, and you'll, you're gonna figure that out. Um, but my point in that is, is uh, you know, back to the basic leadership principles is, you don't know, you don't know who you are until it's, there's adversity, right? And uh, when you're looking in the abyss, that's when you figure out who you are, that's when you figure out who your team is, that's when the team figures out who they are as a team. And many, many, many people just peel away you know, from that, or they fold, right? And that comes back to the veteran side of, um, you know, I'll, I'll always go for the veteran over a non-veteran, all things being equal, or maybe not even being equal, because of that one thing. It's not a guarantee, right? But I'm pretty sure that um, when the shit hits the fan, right, that that person is not gonna uh, run for cover, they're not gonna point fingers, you know, they're used to being there to cover their teammates back, right? And uh, that's a, a an unbelievably important lesson, I just think, in life, whether it's corporate or military, it doesn't really matter. One to hope that I would be able to impart to many people that I've had the chance to, you know, work with over time um, and, and anybody else who's willing to listen to that, right? So those are kind of the basic, uh, you know, things I'd say 52 years later, you know, in my life and, uh, you know, 30 years after West Point and, um, and this corporate career, um, I could probably boil them down to just those few things I just told you, right? And uh, everything else is... Um, Everything else, it's not so much that it's noise, but it's a takeoff of some basic ideas, right? And those basic ideas I don't think are ever gonna change. And, uh, you know, the military doesn't have a lock on this. 
Uh, but they've been at it for a long time, you know, and of these things and adversity under pressure for a very long time, which uh, makes it a very unique organization and a great talent pool to pull from. So, you know, I always make my plug for this wherever I am, which is um, let's let's get vets, you know, into uh, into the workforce. Let's get vets into technology. Let's get vets into cybersecurity. That's my own personal pitch. And if you're not familiar with uh, work that's going on there, particularly the vets in tech, uh, please get familiar with it if you can do something about that. It's a great organization, and uh, you know these are the people that we really need to bring into the workforce to, you know, make a dent um, for us and have the you know the right stuff, right? So let me uh, I'll stop there. Happy to talk about anything you like. Questions? Any uh, rumors? Anything that uh, you know might be interesting? You probably have a very good pulse about cybersecurity in this nation. Uh, how perilous of a threat is it? Where are we as a nation? Who are some bad actors we should be thoughtful about? I would say uh, that cybersecurity is, is um, existential. Uh, and I, I don't mean that as an exaggeration. Uh, I think Paul Nakasone would tell you the same thing, and uh, Keith Alexander before him would have said the same thing, and Mike Rogers and other people I've had the pleasure to you know, work with over the years. Uh, what I mean by that is um, if you think about um, the age we live in, you know, the, uh, people will call it you know, the fourth industrial revolution. They would call it the digital age. I think that's absolutely right. But all that really means is that everything in our life, uh, whether it's personal or professional, is increasingly digital in nature, everything. And it's going to be way more digital in nature in the next five years than it was in the last 15. That's the rate and pace of, uh, of what's happening. The reason for that is cost of compute power keeps going down, right? So we're in the digital age. And the, the things that make uh, digital age capabilities so awesome is that they're digital meaning IP-based and their, their computers, right? And that's the exact thing that can kill it because they're also very susceptible to security um, problems and even more than security, lack of trust. Like if you followed recently what happened with Facebook and all the privacy issues they had, Mark Zuckerberg running around the world testifying in front of governments, actually had nothing to do with security. It just had to do with, do you, can you trust them with your data, right? And the fastest way to lose trust of your customers, um, and if you're a business or you're, if you're a government, right, is a security problem. So if you've been, um, if you were uh, in the um, OPM database as I was, right, <laughs> and probably many of you are, um, you know, that's a problem, right? That's probably, I, I think that's probably the big, the single biggest national security issue we've had in the last 10 years. We just don't know it yet, uh, but it will be, it'll be that, Later, that'll turn out to be the big, single biggest national security issue we've had. Uh, because think about all the information in there on about all of us who are TSSCI cleared and, and, um, and what you could do with that, right? If you, uh, if you chose to blackmail people or um, put pressure on folks, you know, people, you know, people's financial situations, all sorts of things. The IRS, I mean, you can go down the list of things again and again. But what's happening, I think, is uh, we're, as a, as a populace, we're losing trust in the digital. It's bleeding out. Every time you get one more high profile breach or it happens to you, you trust the system a little less. And the Department of Commerce did a really interesting study about four years ago in this when they, they did a survey, uh, went around the United States and did a survey and um, said, is the use of online banking, financial services, just online financial services and online healthcare rising or declining? And the answer is it's declining. Now that may seem super counterintuitive to all of us who live in Silicon Valley, right? And all we ever do is do more, you know, you don't even pump your gas anymore, right? The truck comes and you, know, you have that app, you know, the issue, yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't even have to go to the gas station anymore, right? And, um, you know, but it's, it's declining actually. And the reason for that, number one reason is trust. Where people said, I don't wanna, I'm gonna lose all my information and I'm gonna be held hostage for these things and those things are true. So the, the, the point I'm making that existential is um, that if we don't figure out how do you get security transformation with digital transformation, we won't have digital transformation. And if we don't figure out how you get digital transformation at the rate and pace that's happening right now, we're in a world of hurt because it is the only thing that can keep GDP growth going at the rate that it has to grow for population growth. And if you're in China, you need to bring one million people a day every day out of the royal environment and put them into, uh, into the uh, middle class, right, or lower middle class every day. And the only way we're gonna do that is technology, and it's the same for even uh, more industrialized nations like that. So if we don't figure that out, uh, the impact on GDP uh, will be staggering. It will make the Great Depression look like a cakewalk, right? And all the social unrest that will be associated with that 
you can imagine, will be just chaos, chaos. So it truly, I think, really is existential. And if I could keep going on one other point, because uh, there's uh, something that's being discussed right now that I'm actually leading um, as part of uh, the National Security Advisory Council, which I sit on for the president, for the, for the Obama administration, now the Trump administration. I'm chairing uh, the concept of a cybersecurity moonshot, which is the key off of Kennedy's uh, moonshot, which was, you know, we're gonna go to the moon and bring a man back and alive, right, by the end of the decade. And uh, the idea of the cyber moonshot is we're gonna make the internet safe in 10 years. Uh, because whether they can do that or not, I don't really know, right? But the point is, it's a very ambitious goal and one that everybody would understand. But if we don't actually start to think about security as an existential issue where we can say we actually think we can make the internet safe in 10 years, it's gonna be a problem because coming from the industry, and I can tell you in working in the government, lots of good stuff's being done, it's all incremental. It actually doesn't matter, you know, with the big picture, right? And if we don't think about things entirely differently as a nation about are we gonna own quantum computing or not? Um, what are we gonna do about our education system? If we actually want to make the internet safe and take this as an existential threat, what will we do with STEM education right in this country? We would do things entirely differently. What about supply chain integrity? You go to the White House, you know, or you go to the department, you, you go down to the Pentagon for a meeting you take your phone out of your pocket and you put it in a wooden box and then you leave it outside and you go into the meeting. Why? Because not one single component in an iPhone is manufactured in the United States. Right? It is a listening device. You should assume it is always listening, even when it's off. That's exactly what the government assumes. That's why you can't take it in. Right? And it knows where you are. That's all the stuff. You know, it's, it's live, whether you think about it, whether you think it is or not. Right? So we would, what would we do about supply chain management? We would actually subsidize entire industries that we've offshored for cost reasons, semiconductor, and um, I said on the board of Qualcomm, I can tell you, you know, from personal experience about that, right? For cost reasons, we've allowed every important aspect of supply chain, um, when I say supply chain, I mean components and important things, weapon systems, telecommunications technologies, satellite systems, right? Um, almost none of them are manufactured any longer in the United States. So if we were serious, we would actually subsidize those industries. We'd bring them on shore again, right? Or at least part of them to do that. And I can go down a, I keep going down that list about if we were serious, this is what we would do. We're not serious yet. And everybody's waiting around for whatever that meltdown is, you know, and then, then they're going to get serious and then it's going to be chaos, right? Because that's when the government comes in after something really bad happens and they start regulating and, you know, it's exactly the wrong time to be thinking about it, right? <laughs> When, you, when the uh, the balloon has gone, the cyber balloon has gone up, right? And, and to peel that onion a bit more, in terms of threats, is it the Cambridge Analytica? Is it uh, nation states? In terms of like the audience, like a lot of us went through 9/11 as like unconventional warfare. Is it you know asymmetric threats, or do you see it as country international threats? I think it's asymmetric and. Um, um, it's asymmetric and it is the weapon of choice, obviously, today for nations. Uh, if you look at a country like Iraq or Iran, for example, uh, they're not wealthy nations, right? Uh, North Korea is far from wealthy. Um, it's not hard to master the cyber domain. It doesn't actually take a lot of uh, resources and money. It certainly takes a lot less resources and money than it does to build a nuclear weapon and, you know, and the ballistic capabilities to deliver the nuclear weapon. So that's why everybody's going to cyber. As the, as the main weapon of choice for disruption, to be able to disrupt uh, banking systems, to be able to disrupt elections, right? Very interesting for security, um, and back to this trust concept, is when you're trying to do something bad in security, you're dealing with data, right? You don't even actually have to do something to the data, if you think about it. You don't have to steal it, you don't have to destroy, you can, right, and that, that's very bad. All you have to do is create the impression that it's not accurate. It doesn't matter whether it is or, you know, you don't have to. So if we, if, you know, for example, if I said everybody take out your phone, right, right now, if you have online banking and check your bank account, right, and it said, and you have a thousand dollars, right? And then I said 10 minutes later, everybody check out, take out your phone and check it now, and it said you had five dollars, right? Whether you actually had a thousand dollars or five dollars or not, it wouldn't be the issue. The issue would be the the impression that you did, right? And this meeting would end, and everybody would be outside, and what, you, what would you do? You would, every single one of us would be at an ATM machine trying to put our hands on something, right? Something not digital, physical, money, right? And uh, that's called a run on the banking system, right? 
So if you want to create a run on the banking system, all you have to do is create the illusion that it's not working, whether it actually is or it isn't, right? And that's, the, uh, that's part of the aspect of uh, digital or cyber warfare is just the ability to uh, manipulate the integrity of data, not even the data itself. And that's even easier than manipulating data itself, it's just the integrity. We don't have to look much further, I think, in our country and look at the, uh, the elections and the whole idea of, you know, the Russians had anything to do with the elections and we're still, we're still doing, you know, it's still happening, right? We're still fighting that fight, um, right or wrong, we still are, right? And uh, the Russians are sitting back there saying, huh, that was easy, right? <laughs> look at everything, I, look at all this turmoil I created and, uh, and they have an organized, they have an organized um, group of folks, that's what they're doing. They're trying to just create the illusion that, the, that um, democracy doesn't work. Right? So if you don't think your vote counted, then that's a real problem, right? And that's, and that's easy to do from a cyber perspective. So that's the real issue is the integrity of, of the data, um, even, even more than the data itself. Uh, the military and Bay Area and I would say cybersecurity, we love acronyms. Uh, and a couple of questions uh, from the audience mentioned AI, uh, natural language processing, um, ML. Uh, machine learning. Yep, there you go. How, how will that impact <laughs> cybersecurity? And is, and is it a silver bullet? Yeah. Uh, uh, all of the, well, uh, there's, there's something called artificial intelligence, right? And then everything else is a subset of artificial intelligence, including machine learning and natural process languaging and all these things. Uh, but the, what that means is um, the ability for machines uh, to become more intelligent, right? And, um, and the state of the art in artificial intelligence is very high today, um, but it's also the bottom of the first inning on this. And I would, I would wager to say um, that in five years time, it's gonna be unbelievably different from the state of the art, unbelievably different. And in cybersecurity, I would, I would bet you everything that in three to five year times, uh, most of the attacks we're seeing today that we all worry about, we're all trying to fight, um, there won't be any human beings involved in the attack. It will all be machines, all be computers. Right? So it'll be uh, computers and they're getting, and they get smarter and smarter and faster and faster and the cost of compute power goes down, thing I said before. And you know, if you're in our business today in cybersecurity and, you're, and you have any sense of the future, um, what you're thinking about right now is um, how do we stop bringing people to a software fight? We better bring a lot of software to a software fight and we better figure out artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these other bird terms, at least it's the same pace, if not faster, than the bad guys do, because when machines are on the other side of the attacks all the time, there's very little human beings, and we're very manual in nature, the game is over. And that is, that is not five years away, right, what I just said, not to, not to be like, oh my God, you know, but that's, that's what's happening. Right? And you throw on top of that uh, quantum computing, and um, you know, quantum computing is basically as the pow uh, computing power of uh, an exponentially uh, larger um, level of compute power than anything we know today. Um, if the bad guys get that figured out first, um, literally everything we know of, sec of security is over, it's finished. Because almost everything we know about security is based on the ideas of, of using cryptography and what's you know, public key infrastructures and all these things that you're, if you're in this business, a little bit you know about that, which is in essence, if I'm gonna protect something, I'm gonna use PKI technology, which is I'm going to keep, I'm going to put uh, a lock on it, you know, a cryptographic lock on it. And if you want to break the lock, you would have to figure out the code for the lock. And if you want to apply a computer against that code, every time your computer gets smarter, I'll just add a few more digits to the code because the, the, uh, the, the number of, of variables in there would increase literally exponentially every time I put one more, you know, one more number against that. And uh, quantum just ends that uh, because it can, it, it can crack any code, right? no matter how long those digits get, uh, very, very quickly. So you know, our entire concept of how we do security um, today is based on, on cryptography and being able to you know, just keep adding digits right, so that the computers, no matter how smart they get, can't break the code anymore. And that's, that's about the end. That will end in less than 10 years um, in, for us for all intent and purposes, and that, meaning that quantum will be a commercial reality in uh, 10 years or less, I would wager the Chinese will have it in, um, um, in very production or, you know, production level capabilities in five. 
Um, they are way more serious about this than we are, by the way, back to my wound shot and things. That's their, their, the whole quantum program. Like we had the Manhattan Project. That's what they're doing with quantum computing, right? And uh, it's, it's a race that, in my opinion, we're losing right now. We have to fix that. So you mentioned China, and you're on the board of Qualcomm. Uh, and in our audience, Raj uh, uh, was the head of DIUX, and there's some members of DIUX. I'm curious what your thoughts are around government and industry collaboration around uh, <coughs> cybersecurity. Yep. So um, Raj uh, uh, is, a, is a great leader, uh, former Air Force uh, officer. Um, and uh, highly qualified to run DIUX, mostly because he worked at Palatine Networks, uh, you know, before that. <laughs> but um, yeah, the idea of the what we, in our world, we would call this the public-private partnership, right? And um, it's very interesting because in um, the things that we deal with as a nation when it comes to cybersecurity, where people are get exercised about it, rightfully so, they sound like national security or law enforcement. Right? So somebody steals your your, your money out of your bank account or your social security number, your identity or something along those lines. As an individual, um, you know, you feel like the same as if somebody broke into your house and stole something, right? So when that happens, you call the police and then the police show up and they, they, I, they try to do something, right? And they usually have the capability to go do something about that. But when it comes to cyber, they can't do anything. You know, almost nothing, right? And as a nation, yeah, when we read about um, whichever nation it is comes in and hacks whatever system they hack and they steal our intellectual property or their weapons plans or whatever it is, um, that's a, that sounds like a national security problem. When you have a national security problem, you call the Marines, right, or the Army or somebody like that, and they go do something about it, right, in, in, in a kinetic world. In a cyber world, they can't do anything, or very, very little about that, right? So the public-private partnership concept is all based on the reality that something about 95 of the assets that um, have to do with cybersecurity and doing something about cybersecurity are not in the control of the government. They're actually in, in my hands, right? Or Qualcomm's hands or Facebook's hands or you know, uh, AT&T's hands or things along those lines. So if we can't figure out how the government and industry work together, it doesn't matter what the government does. It literally doesn't matter, right, what they do. I think there's something very interesting. I would, I would bet you, right, if I go back to the if we don't sort things out much faster than we are and take things seriously, um, I would also wager to say that we will see a massive cyber event. Um, people like to talk about digital Port Harbor all the time. I actually don't think that's the biggest problem for us. I think it's just all this trust going away, like I said before. It's a more subtle problem. But we'll see a big cyber issue someday, right? Who knows, a terrorist, you know, a cyber attack, maybe, maybe a nation state attack. It's all cyber. and. Um, and when it happens, um, it would be, in my opinion, very likely that the next step that the government would do, because they have no, they've done no planning for this in advance, um, I think, which I think is a real shame, uh, they will nationalize assets. Uh, they're, they will nationalize, for a period of time, they're going to nationalize the ISPs, the telcos, uh, anybody they can get their hands on, right? Because they're going to say, we've got to do something about this, but we don't have, we don't actually have the assets as the government. We can't fire the missile, right? And they're going to come and do that. That's why I say this will lead to terrible, this will lead to terrible um, jurisprudence and terrible regulations and all these things I mentioned before because that's what they're going to do, right? It would be way better to figure it out in advance. And, it, and something that the NSTAC, this body I've served on for 10 years um, in D.C., one of the studies we did was actually called IT mobilization, which broached the topic, which was very controversial, of creating the, um, the legal structure for that to happen. So that if the cyber balloon went up, we were at war, nobody doubted, not kinetic war, cyber war. Nobody doubted that, right? Everybody agreed with that. Uh, what would we do, right? When the government said, how would we defend against that attack? We, we should plan for that. And we have some, actually some history in our country that we've done research on. And, on, uh, there's only been a couple times where that's been thought about before and exercised by the government. One is the merchant marines, right? And that's probably the most relevant one, which is uh, merchant marine was created uh, because this was a similar concept. Nobody would want the United States Navy or, uh, or the Coast Guard to um, own all the ships, all the commercial shipping. That would be a really bad idea. Um, so they didn't, but they said, but you know, we might need those ships someday, right? <laughs> In a time of a crisis. So they created the entire idea of the Merchant Marine back in the 19, uh, 1930s. And um, they, created the, they created the legal authority 
to na basically nationalize all the shipping in the United States when we need it. They, and then they created um, the hierarchy. They created the Merchant Marine Academy. Right? And, every, and most of the folks who are in the commercial in, uh, shipping industry actually are in the Merchant Marine. They have rank and structure and they practice. It's not their full-time job. It's like the National Guard, right? And only two times in the history of the United States has that actually been um, used. And that was used in World War II and for a very short period of time in Vietnam, only twice, right? But using that analogy, saying maybe we should have that same kind of concept in the United States where we know what the assets are we would need, we leave them in commercial hands, we create, um, maybe we use the National Guard for this, I don't know, right? We create the structure that's out there where people who are in the, on the civilian side, they actually train with their government counterparts that in the event of an emergency, this is how these assets would be organized under a U.S. government authority for a short period of time to be brought to bear. Maybe we would have, a, maybe we'd have a, our newest military academy right, to, uh, to train folks um, to create the core cadre, uh, as we've done with all the military academies. They, they graduate very, 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 very few percentage of the, uh, the folks who actually go on active duty, uh, but that is the core, has been in our entire country's history of the officer cadre on, um, on, on everything else, right? So lots of interesting ideas in there that, that we really need to think about as a nation, again, if we were serious about it. Yeah. <laughs> there were a couple questions from the audience around China. And just today in the New York Times, uh, talked about how there was Chinese tech firms, Facebook, and uh, they were potentially getting Facebook data. Uh, and I know this is a sensitive subject given uh, Qualcomm and Broadcom, but as, to as much as you can comment on, um, how does uh, trade with China, uh, consideration of Chinese nationals working in technology, uh, Chinese sourcing managers for US firms, how does that impact given China's rise in technology yeah, uh, super difficult problem, right? Uh, and we're dealing with it all the time in, here in Silicon Valley because we have such an, a deficit of um, skilled individuals, uh, particularly in software coding here, right? So, um, you know, a giant, a giant part of the Silicon Valley magic and engine is um, is immigration. Um, so we need that, right? Um, and because we're not doing it on our own, right? <laughs> yeah, so we have to do that. Um, I I can assure you uh, that other nations, some other nations. Um, have entire programs um, that today, you know, or if we were sitting here 30 years ago, we would have called them, um, you know, spy programs or something along those lines, like deep cover, you know, kind of stuff, um, that they are training folks uh, who are uh, software experts, cyber experts, um, and they they go deep cover. Uh, they have, they look just like normal people, right, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and they're, they're sent to the United States to come work at uh, all the companies in Silicon Valley. And, they, and probably should assume they are. And they're, they're either active or sleepers, and you know, they're siphoning off uh, tons of, of information. Um, I, would, I, would, I would bet you that's happening, right? Yeah. And uh, so you, know, you have to start with um, your own people. Like, do you even know who works for you? And can you trust them? And, and, and then you start to get into a whole host of other things after that where I talked about supply chain, and I think we should be actually pretty nervous about that. And then there's also a real, another really interesting aspect, particularly with China, which is China's a very big market. It's got a lot of people, right? And a lot of US companies do a lot of business in China. And the more business that you do in China, the more dependent you become on the Chinese market for your business. And the more dependent you come, the more likely you are to say yes to things, you know, when the Chinese start to, or the Russians, even a better example, right? They don't have the same kind of market power. But when they start to say, if you would like to do business any longer in China, let me tell you what way it's going to be. Your data centers will be in China. We're going to do source code reviews. Um, you will hire X percent of your employees will be uh, in China. Um, and, and, and the list goes on and on and on. And it's not overnight. It's been a very, very gradual you know, process where you can look around today and say, there are a lot of U.S. companies, important U.S. companies, that um, if the Chinese tomorrow said, you can't do business here anymore, or you can't buy components any longer from our country, they'd be dead, it, literally dead, you know. And uh, that's, a that's a hell of a position to be in, you know, as a CEO, right, to say, you know, the next time that the, 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 the next notch that goes up on whether it's Russia or China or whatever market you're trying to be in, where they say, let me tell you what it costs to do business here on, from a cyber perspective and intellectual property perspective, 
it's you know increasingly difficult for people to say no. I will. I'll, I'll take my chances and walk away from your market, right? So the trade aspect of this is very, very real, and we just saw this in the reverse. Very interesting. I wouldn't expect that it would happen this way. We just saw this in the reverse when the administration, Obama administration first, Trump administration now, you know, in essence, shut down ZTE. I guess we're back in business now. I'm not really sure, but you know, shut down ZTE in the reverse and just said. Out of business, in the United States, and that company went bankrupt in you know in 30 days. Right now, it's on life support and being resuscitated. But you know that could happen in the opposite way uh, to a lot more U.S. firms. Here's a, uh, we're pivoting back to leadership. Uh, in our last leadership lessons learned, we had Chip Berg, the CEO of Levi Strauss. He reiterated a lot of things you said around values. Uh, and one question is, how do you ask and how do you determine if someone will be a good leader, have integrity, have value? Um, well, there, there are a couple of ways, you know, that I've done that over time. We do that over time. One would be, um, uh, you know, a company's um, average interview process is four interviews to get a job. Um, one way to test for this is uh, we do nine on average. Um, and the last five after the first four have nothing to do with competency, right? It's just who are you as a person. A little trick that I've done, uh, um, you can't do this, you can't scale this, right? So it's only for most senior executives, which the reason I do it, because um, I think that um, culture comes from the top. It comes, you know, culture is just people, people hanging out with each other for a while, right? That's gonna create a culture, and uh, le the leaders are the beginning of that. So I you know, pay a massive amount of attention to who are the leaders. And uh, go through the whole interview process. Uh, one of my last, my, my favorite things to do at the end is to invite myself to dinner at their house. And, um, and the reason for that is uh, very, a little unorthodox, is um, you see everything, right? You know, go and you sit, the, you know, you're at the end of the process, you think of the right person, you go to their house, and you see the husband, you see the wife, you see the children, right? You see how they treat each other, you see how they talk to each other, you see what's on the walls, what they value as individuals, and you see it all, right? And uh, it's extraordinarily telling one way or the other, right? It either confirms your thesis, or should give you, you know, you know a couple times to give me pause to say, whoa, you know, it's uh, not as advertised, you know, apparently, so. Anyway, it's just, there's, there's a couple tricks, you know, to do it. <laughs> nice. Um, so, so take away, invite ourselves to prospective employees. Every one of them for dinner. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Can you tell us a challenging time from when you were at Talento Networks? What was the challenge? How did you get um, it would be hard to pick the most challenging one because we had a lot of challenges. Uh, Palo Alto has been an extraordinarily successful company, like I said before, uh, because the team is amazing and cybersecurity is a big deal, right? It's in the right place, with the right team at the right time. Um, and despite the fact that it's, uh, if you looked at its growth over, you know, 10 years time, it's a very, it's, it's, you know, it's a very linear looking up into the right line, um, but it had a lot of these, you know, along the way, right? Uh, so, but I'll, I'll tell you one of the, um, about two years ago, um, we, you know, companies wildly successful every quarter, beat and raise, beat and raise, stocks really high, you know, everybody's happy. And, um, and we kind of uh, fell in love uh, with our tools as a company. We love data, you know. And uh, we started to trust our tools more than we trusted our people in, uh, in sales. And our data was telling us all sorts of things that if you, if you turn the knob to the left 12 degrees, um, you, with this, uh, you know, in sales to do this, you'll get 2% more productivity from each salesperson. And, and we turned the knob to the left 12 degrees. And it turned out actually the tools were, uh, were wrong on things that, you know, the, the subtleness of human interaction couldn't find. And, um, and we missed a quarter, which is, as a public company, that's, uh, you know, danger close, right? That's a problem. And uh, so we missed a quarter, we got clobbered, stock went down 35% in 24 hours. Um, all of a sudden we went from the greatest company in the world to um, these guys are a bunch of idiots, starting with McLaughlin, and you know everything's terrible, the whole thing's falling apart, and then you're dealing with morale issues and all sorts of stuff. And um, you know that was one of those times I mentioned when I was talking to say, um, you know, that's where you find yourself, right? So you know, as a leader, you need to own that problem. And then you need to rally around that and understand what the problem was and, and go in front of the troops and say, yo, we, there are no excuses for that. Here's exactly what happened. 
That's, it's, it's entirely my fault because all those things have to be somebody's entirely fault, right? It's entirely my fault. Here's what we're going to go do about it. And, um, if you, tr and, and if you trust us to get it right, give us six months, give us nine months, we'll get it right. And, um, in that case, we did get it right more than right. Um, and, and almost nobody left the company, even though it was all doom and gloom. And I mentioned that one because um, the, you know, there is a saying that's very, very true, which is what, um, whether it's leadership or your, or your reputation or your credibility, it takes the lifetime to build it up, right? And, and that saying, you can spend it in a second. You know? And uh, when it comes to companies and corporations or even you know, military, um, you can spend years and years and years, and you should, you know, building credibility with the organization, with your shareholders, with your board of directors, um, on you're going to do the right thing every time, um, so that when the crisis comes, they're going to trust you. They're going to give you the shot to fix it, uh, because if you don't have that credibility in the bucket to be drawn or your bank account to be drawn down against, then you really have a problem. And um, you know, leaders build credibility constantly and consistently build credibility, and sometimes they have to spend it. Uh, to get it back again, right? But that was a very, very challenging uh, period for us, uh, and it turned out um, probably um, made us so much better than we are today, so much better as an organization that I'm glad it happened. Yeah, right. I can say it's easy. I just retired, but you know, uh, glad it happened, right? So, last set of questions, more around work life. A lot of leaders have come through. A lot of them, oftentimes, don't address work life balance. Uh, met your son. Uh, I'm curious how you manage that. Uh, a lot of us leave the military because we want a more stable work life. So thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I would say um, I am I am not the person to give advice on that. Um, so it's you know just the <laughs> just reality. So if I look back and say you know 30 years of or 35 years of time, I'd say you know there's so many things I say. Well, I just wish I'd done that differently, differently. But on the other hand. Um, maybe not, right? You know, because there's every everything is that balance. Uh, the way that I've the way that I've uh, uh, discussed that or operated that way at work, um, and I try to do as many new hire employee training sessions as I can, mostly to so I can tell people, let me tell you about the company you joined, so there's no mistake. Like uh, this is who we are, right? This is who we are for culture and character and values. But I always bring this topic up, and I say on the work life balance front. Um, this is a very hard working company. Uh, people are here to win. They work very hard. Um, and, um, on the, and you need to figure it out. Not, not that we don't care. I care. I care deeply. I have children and, you know, like, like, I'm, I'm not saying it's, there is no work life balance. I just can't tell you how to get it. <laughs> and the company's not here to, uh, to sort that out for you. All right. So what you'll get here is you'll get a great, job you're going to work with the smartest people in the world in cybersecurity. we're going to work really hard we're here to win um but you need to draw your own boundaries you can create your own boundaries around this because we'll suck you dry that's the nature of you know highly competitive businesses and and, and high performance teams the, as soon as you get a high performance team and it gets to here what a good leader does is it it raises the bar right because that's the only way the organization will step up to what they're capable of as you keep raising the bar so we'll suck you dry, um, not because we're malicious, <laughs> and the company will suck me dry too, right? You know, it's just the nature of the beast. So, so you need to figure out your own boundaries, and and we'll respect them. But we're not here to set those boundaries for you, um, and we're not going to wash your car, we're not going to wash your dog, we're not going to massage you, we're not going to, and we don't do that, you know. And a lot of companies do do that, and um, we we never did any of that. Say, so you're you're. It's back to the accountability and responsibility. Your reward. You know, for working at Palo Alto Networks is more work if you're good. And so that you can challenge yourself and raise the bar and find out who you really are. And, and you know, I'll call it the self-actualization, right, if you want to talk about Maslow. But, you know, self-actualization about who you are, that's the only way you're going to figure it out. So on a personal level, like I said, I'm not the one to give advice on that. <laughs> Last question, hopefully yeah. a softball one. Where are you going fishing first and where are your favorite fishing holes? Uh, so my, 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 I love to go fly fishing. I don't do enough of it. And uh, on uh, Saturday, I'll be on a little truckie up at Lake Tahoe. So <laughs> look for me there. <laughs> I want to thank Mark again thank for you. being here. Uh, thank you for everything you've done for uh, veterans with recruiting. I, uh, as you mentioned, vets in tech, 
And uh, I know you all just hired on Dustin Whitten, who's uh, actually uh, was ROTC instructor with me. Oh, wow. and, um, uh, and thank you all for being here. And thank you for your words of wisdom. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Thank you.